by our church. Come on, stand to your feet. Put your hands together. How many know that God is fighting for us? Shout it out, shout it out. 
principality by yourself, you're supposed to be tired. Because if the joy of the Lord is my strength, then what am I fighting for? If the fight is happening, if the fight is already fixed, so don't worry about it. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him. And he'll knock every principality down in your life. Do you believe that tonight? Lift up your hands in the room. Yeah, man.
Bible says the battle does not belong to us. How many know that battle you're facing doesn't belong to you? It may feel like it. It may look like it. But you know what the word says? The word says we are to walk by faith and not by sight. So the battle that is before you, it's not yours. It's the Lord's. I want to encourage you to cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. That battle you're walking through, that fight you're fighting, give it over to God and watch him destroy your enemies. That's what the word says. Let him be exalted and your enemies will be scattered. How many need your enemies to be scattered tonight? Let me tell you something. When you worship him, when you exalt him and you put the focus on heaven, God will show up in your life. If you're stressed, if you're dealing with worry, the Bible is clear. It says, don't, don't worry, don't stress. Let every petition be made known to God through prayer, through thanksgiving. So tonight, let's go before the Lord in prayer. If you're watching online, we want to thank all of those who are connecting tonight. Because Wednesdays do matter here at Inspire. And guess what? God is ready and able to meet any need you may have. So I want to invite you to join us in prayer tonight. Whether it's cancer, whether it's a diagnosis, whether there's something affecting your family, the threat of divorce. If you have children that have walked away from God, let me tell you something. God can bring, can bring back the prodigal. God will speak to the prodigal. So, Father God, tonight we thank you for you sit on the throne, Lord, and you have all authority, Father. So tonight we just surrender our hearts to you. And God, we surrender our thoughts. And God, the word is very clear. It says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. There may be a weapon formed, but Father God, we stand on the word that declares that weapon will not prevail, Lord. And Father God, we speak a life right now in the name of Jesus, where the enemy has brought the thought of death and suicide and pain. God, we declare freedom right now in the name of Jesus. For the word says, he whom the Son set free is free indeed. So we declare freedom right now to reign in this place. Reign through the airways right now in the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you, if you're dealing with sickness in your body, come on, can you stand on the word that says by his stripes, we are healed, we were healed. So we speak healing right now. Diabetes, you will not win. COVID-19, you will not win. Heart disease, you will not win. We speak to cancer right now. We speak to tumors right now that they need to dry up in the name of Jesus. We command the power of God to just move in your body, to move in your home right now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for the word says that there is nothing too hard for those that would believe. We thank you tonight for your presence. We thank you for the promises of God. For the promises of God are yes and amen. Can you say amen tonight? Can you give Jesus a hand? Can you give Jesus a hand? Thank you for being with us tonight. We're excited to be with you. You may take your seat. Show some love to your neighbor. Tell him thank you for being here. Real excited to have you here with us, man. Wednesdays inspire right here at, at our church, man. God is moving powerfully. I'm excited because, man, Pastor Victor Flores is going to be preaching the word tonight, man. Give, a, give Victor a hand, man. We're excited. Aren't you glad you are, you're a part of a church that's, man, thriving and moving in the spirit of God? Listen, we want to honor the Lord with our giving, and the word is very clear. Jesus, the, the Bible tells us that, man, God will supply every need. Jesus will supply every need according to his riches and glory. Every need, any need you may have, let me tell you something, God will meet that need, but it moves with faith. And what is a move of faith? Your seed. Tonight as you give, let me tell you something, there's activation, there's a partnership with God that happens. That's what the word says, test me, try me, prove me with your need. God knows your need, but guess what? If you step out on faith and you trust God with your seed, that causes heaven to respond. It causes heaven to respond to your need. No matter what it is, it's never too great because guess what? God has complete authority over your situation, even your finances, even your job situation, even that business idea. God will supply the need, but you must move in faith. Amen. 
How many have your seed ready tonight? Maybe you're at home. We have five ways to give. Man, connect tonight with your faith as you sow that seed and know that God will move on your behalf. Amen? I really believe giving is also part of our worship. So I want to invite you to lift your seed to heaven. Lift your seed to heaven. God, we thank you tonight for the seed, for it has the power to break the curse of poverty. And we thank you that as we give tonight, Lord God, we're giving it to fertile soil that will bring forth a hundredfold return. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to sow. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Inspire Church, we love you. God bless you.
just as heavier so when you get here it's like it's a weight but I dare you that in this moment to give that weight to the father to give that concern to the father to give that worry to the father because the scripture says every weight every weight every concern everything that bothers you a lot of times you see you uh we live this life and we forget sometimes that that we hurt. God is not oblivious to your stress. And the reason why he's not is because he's in the room. And that means he's concerned. When he shows up, it's a purpose. When he's here, he's always here. But when he expands himself, so in this moment, just the next few seconds, just lift up your hands and just inhale and exhale. A lot of times we we, we rush the shout, but we don't push the silence. Whew. And sometimes it's in the, I feel God right here. And sometimes it's in the silence that he speaks the loudest. So just take this moment and just breathe. Breathe. It's going to be okay. Oh, I feel you in the room. Breathe. Breathe. Whew. Breathe. Breathe into me, uh, just breathe into me once again. We give you glory, God. That's it. Some of you going to sleep really good tonight. We rebuke insomnia right now in the name of Jesus. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the throne of grace. And Father, with hands lifted, we say now, we give you all majesty, all honor, all glory, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. And everybody who agreed shouted, amen. Amen. Now right here, you can give that shout. Right here, you can give that praise. That's it. Release a shout to the Lord. God bless you. Amen. The presence of the Lord is here among us tonight. We're going to pray just a little bit more before we're seated. Father, we thank you today. Father, we thank you for your presence. Father, we thank you for your mercy. King Jesus, we bless you tonight. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We, we magnify your name. Lord, we acknowledge your presence that's among us tonight. Heavenly Father, how precious is your presence to us, God. We, 
We love your presence. As we were just stating a moment ago, it brings us peace. Father, the, the troubles that ail us, the comes against us, Lord, we thank you that in your presence it has to move, it has to give way. Father, we, we rest here in your presence. We wait in your presence, God. We, we worship you in your presence, Father. We thank you right now. We thank you that there's nothing that's too hard for you, God. We thank you that miracles occur in your presence, God. We thank you that each of us, as we stand here, those who watch online, God, we, our heart is for you, God. Our, our mind is on you, Lord. We, we've come for you. We feel like Mary tonight, that we, we just want to sit at your feet and hear your word, God. We, we woke up, and, and it, like David said, we have one desire on our heart, and it's to be in the house of the Lord and behold your beauty. Our eyes want to catch a glimpse of the risen one tonight. Our hearts want a revelation who has captured the attention of heaven tonight. Our Lord, our minds want to stay on you. It says in Isaiah that you keep them at perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord. Father, we want our hearts and minds on you tonight. Father, we know that the earth is, is trembling. We know that nations are shaking. We know that kingdoms, Father, are buckling under the pressure of this hour. It said in Psalm 2 that the nations would rage, Father, but we are blessing you because it said that you would place your king on your holy mountain. And Father, we're, we got our eyes on the one who's seated on high tonight. We're not going to be worried about the struggles that even we face in our own individual lives. Father, we thank you that there's a higher vision. You said when you see these troubles, lift up your eyes for your redemption draws near. Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for your presence tonight. Holy Spirit, we bless you. It's, you said you can do nothing without you, God, that we can do nothing without you, but with you, God, we can do all things. So, Father, we acknowledge our dependence on you tonight. We acknowledge, Father, that we're ever in need of your assistance, Father, that you truly are our helper, God, and we bless you because you're always faithful toward us. In Jesus' mighty name, we, our confession is that we love you tonight. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. It's always a blessing to be with you here at our midweek service, our recharge service here at Inspire Church. The presence of God is here. I just want to keep on praying. The Lord is, is in this place. I don't want to move from this atmosphere. In fact, the topic I'll be speaking on tonight is on prayer, and I just want to get right into the Word of God tonight. Um, one second. I'm reading initially... This is from the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 20 of the Message Translation. It says, But you, dear friends, carefully build yourself up in this, in this most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit, staying right at the center of God's love, keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our Master, Jesus Christ. This is the unending life, the real life. Matthew chapter 11, verses 22 to 26, Jesus replied, let the faith of God be in you. Listen to the truth I speak to you. Whoever says to this mountain with great faith and does not doubt, mountain be lifted up and thrown into the midst of the sea and believes that what he says will happen, it will be done. This is the reason I urge you to boldly believe for whatever you ask for in prayer, be convinced that you've received it and it will be yours. And whenever you, are, you stand praying, if you find that you carry something in your heart against another person, release him and forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also release you and forgive you of all your faults. But if you will not release forgiveness, don't expect your Father in heaven to release you from your misdeeds. The first verse we read, I, I, love that, I love what it said, that keep your arms open, ready for the mercy of God. The enemy wants to tell us that's not what you should expect, that you came here tonight and you, you, the Lord might be looking to, 
to knock you over the head or, or some type of judgment on your life or some type of negative response because of something we may have done in the past. But I love that in the book of Jude that it says, keep your arms stretched out, ready for the mercy of the master. Tonight, I'm talking from the topic of mountain movers. And I know what we just read the Lord Jesus say that speak to this mountain and be moved. But the reality is sometimes we don't want to pray in that way. We don't want to stir up our faith to believe for big miracles because we just sometimes don't fully, we're not fully confident that the Lord wants to hear us in the place of prayer for, what, for whatever reason, whether it be that our past is, in, is, is inhibiting us or, or even just we feel like we're not worthy for some other reason, like we've not earned or attained a certain height in, in the Lord or we're not at a certain level of maturity. I love what the Lord said that he revealed it to babes, amen, what, what many had longed to see. He revealed it to, to young people who were walking in miracles, and it wasn't, in fact, that they earned it, that no one will ever stand before the Lord or in the presence of the Lord and see miracles happen or, as we're talking about tonight, just something huge moving, what Jesus called a, a mountain. You'll never see it moved and be able to puff up your chest and say, man, that was, that was me that did that. That was because of how much... I fasted, I fasted for, the, for 41 days, and I prayed for 22 days. That's not, that's not going to be the, the basis of, of why you're going to see that miracle. Now, those things help. Make no mistake, they, they do, but they help to position you, not to earn the miracle, but so that you can be postured to receive and believe for the miracle. And so tonight, I want to help us with that. We've already been doing it. I want to talk about getting that, getting into that place, like the book of Jude said, stirring up, building up, being in a place where our most holy faith is stirred up, amen. And, and right now, we're in an atmosphere of faith right now that God can do anything, that those who are watching, even those in person, that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. What we've been doing up until this time, we've been stirring our hearts, shifting our focus from everything else and putting it on the Lord. We've actually already taken substantial, made substantial progress in this direction for already tonight, God, to answer a miracle type prayer. Amen. Do you believe that tonight, that God can do something mighty in your life? And you know, it's interesting because sometimes um, we don't, we might not see that we need a major miracle. And so we might not stir ourselves up for this, but God doesn't only want us to believe for ourselves. Amen. God wants us to contend for others. I, I, I think of Joshua in the scripture and he, and he would go on to inherit one day, just briefly speaking, he, he would go on to inherit his promise, but it came to Joshua when, after he contended for someone else to receive their promises, amen, inherit what the Lord had for them. And so I wanna tell you also tonight that while we're gonna talk about mountains in our own life, let's not forget that one of the primary things God wants us to do is contend for others, amen? The, the primary passage, our launching passage, the story we're pulling from tonight is out of the book of Genesis chapter 18. This is what it says. It says, verse one, the Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamer. One day Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while, rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet, and since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. And they, and they said, all right, do what you've said. So Abraham ran back to the tent, said to Sarah, hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, and bake some bread. This is the story of the three men, of course, who come to meet Abraham, the great a uh, familiar passage about the theophany in, in this passage, but it's interesting because what we see is initially he bows low, but the story doesn't end just with him and the three men communi communing and, and eating together. It actually goes on to, to, go, to go to the portion of the story where now Abraham is interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. If you'll remember where the Lord um, asks, tells him about what he's going to do in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And Abraham says, well, Lord, if, you know, will you, if there's 50 righteous, don't destroy the city. If there's 40 righteous, don't destroy the city. We remember the story. Now, it's interesting that when this interaction happened, that what's ultimately what's about to occur, Abraham isn't even aware of this. He's about to be at the table and praying a prayer that could shift entire cities. Amen. That his prayer, this one man's prayer, are impacting ent entire communities of people. And so what, what we, get, we gather from that is one man's prayers, one person's prayers, one woman's prayers can move heaven, amen, and they can shift what happens in a city. That God doesn't need even two or three. He can, he can use two or three. We know that he promises to be present where there are two or three. But how many of you know God just needs one? He just needs one Daniel. It's interesting that in your life, you can see a mountain move in your individual life. You can see God do mighty wonders. And any, you live for any length of time, you might not see it immediately, but you are going to be hit with an obstacle. I'm not prophesying negativity to you, but you might come up against a wall in your life where you need God to break in. But even if you've not reached that point, and I'm not saying it's going to come, but I would, I would warn you and urge you to be ready for a day when you may need God to break in with a miracle and not just for another, but even if that day has not come for you, how many of you know that we have a call, we have the ability, we are, are given the, the, the option to, we are, are welcome to do so, that we could come before the Lord and contend for an entire city, even an entire nation. That's what Daniel did. Daniel stood before the Lord on behalf of Israel, shifted a nation through his prayers. I'm moved by that because I, I know how much time I have in the day, and I know I know what, what, what I could be doing. I know what my time goes to. And to know that I have within me the capability to bless an entire nation, to shift an entire city, it becomes very difficult for me now to look at community leaders or anybody else and, sh and blame shift and, and put, put anything on them as to what's happening in, in a particular city or a particular region and not take authority or, or some responsibility and say, well, the buck stops at the kingdom of God. We're the, the what the Bible would call the, the called out ones and that the ecclesia, we've, we've heard about this term and really what we've, what we, we've come to learn and know about it is it, it, the Lord was talking about a legislative body of believers that what we are actually here in the earth is somewhat of an embassy or somewhat of a governmental um, establishment that's, that's, that's representing the kingdom of God, initiating, establishing what the Lord wants to do. This is why he would say, when you pray, when you pray, pray that heaven, our, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. That what we're doing is establishing the kingdom here on earth. And that doesn't just happen through the preaching of the gospel. That is one of the primary functions of how the kingdom of God is established. But it comes through the place of prayer. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the story of Charles Finney, one of my favorite um, leaders throughout church history, Charles Finney. I, great, I draw great inspiration from Charles, Charles Finney. He's known for for participating in, in, in many of the great revivals that touched our nation, specifically in the Northeast. And it's interesting because his ministry began, and he began to experience revival. But when it hit its peak, and he really began to see what the, the, the moves that, that began to get uh, notoriety to the point where we even know, the, know about them today, places like Rochester, New York, 100,000 or rather 500,000 souls saved in a matter of 90 days. When things like that were happening, he had already been ministering for some time. And while he was ministering, he met a, he met a man that, by the name of Daniel Nash. And Daniel Nash was moved in one of his meetings, one of the meetings that Charles Finney was preaching in. And Daniel Nash, from that point on, would go on to, to, pr to, to prepare the way for Charles Finney from city to city. And so if Charles Finney was going, for example, if he would be coming to Houston next week, um, Daniel Nash would come before him, rent out an old cellar, and be in the place of prayer for sometimes two, three weeks at a time, calling on God before Charles Finney ever came into a region to preach. A lot of people attribute the mighty moves of God, not just to the preaching of Charles Finney, but to the prayers of Daniel Nash. Amen. And that's, that's what we see throughout Scripture. Even the, the ministry of Jesus was preceded by a prayer ministry of repentance. Amen. The, the voice of the, of the one Christ 
crying in the wilderness, make ye the path straight for the Lord. And it, we know it was a ministry of not just repentance, right? It, it, had, to, it had to be of, of prayer because when, when, when the disciples of the Lord came to him, they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples, that John was a man of prayer. John, what, what he demonstrated and prepared in one of his tools that he used in preparing the way for the Lord was getting into the place of prayer. And we see this all throughout scripture as well, of course, before the day of Pentecost ever comes, before Peter ever preaches that amazing sermon, what happens? He's in a room with 120 praying. And so I know, I know Peter gets a lot of accolade and, and I'm not trying to diminish anything from Peter because that was a great sermon. But I want to tell you, it wasn't just Peter's preaching. It was 120 in that room contending for the promises of God. Amen. And in our community, in our city, we're seeing a lot that we don't want to see. Um, of course, right now, very in our, just the elephant in the room, the, the thing that's facing us in our day-to-day -day is COVID-19. There are issues that face us. And I want to see... Our government have solutions. I want to see many things happen, and I'm believing for, for, for our leaders to, to have strategies to, to help us. I'm all for it, and I believe in it, but I am first and foremost convicted and believe that the, the first strategy of the kingdom of heaven, the first thing the Lord is looking to is the church and us to be in the place of prayer, amen, that I believe that that as our pastor was saying this past Sunday, that we can seed the clouds, amen, in the place of prayer and shift what God wants to do. The example he used was Elijah who, who would go into the, the cave and, and when he was in there, he prayed seven times and finally saw the cloud appear that we can shift whether it rains or doesn't rain over a nation that was one man. Again, I say one person shifting what would happen over an entire nation. But the question then has to become when we hear about people praying in this way, when we see these kind of things happening, we almost have to ask, why isn't it happening? Or rather, how does it happen then? If it, do, if it can happen, why isn't it? Or, and, and if it can, how can I? And so number one, how can you be in a position? How can you be postured to get into a place where you can see God shift things over an entire nation? I, I don't want to belabor the point, but there are some things that we're seeing in our world today that we just don't want to see. There's some things we're seeing here in our own county that we just don't want to see. And you, it wouldn't take much time watching the news to see those. I don't need to list statistics, but I want to encourage you tonight that we can see these things shift. We can see God move with great revival. I'll give one more one more word of encouragement before I get into some how-tos on how to do this, but one of, one of the other stories that really encourages me is there's a famous revival called the Welsh Revival, and this was led by a young man named Evan Roberts, and it wasn't only him, but he was one of the primary leaders in the Welsh Revival, and it's interesting because it, it really began with a question I read one day that he was talking to one of his roommates, and he said, do you think God can save 100,000 souls? It was just a question. It had not happened. God had not been moving yet. God had, had been, the hand of God had been on, on Evan for a while, but they, they hadn't had meetings yet. They haven't, hadn't started their prayer meetings yet. Nothing had, had begun, but he had this question in his mind. Do you think God can save 100,000 souls? By the end of the revival, guess how many souls God had saved in wells? Exactly 100,000 souls are what they documented. And so I believe God heard that question that night. Even if it wasn't the primary prayer of Evan, God wanted to speak to him. And I draw encouragement on that, that we can see the people of Houston and Harris County saved. Amen. One of my prayers is that God would move in a mighty way in our city. He has, he is, and we just want to see it continue. Amen. So how do we do this? How do we position ourselves for this? We just read in the book of Genesis I don't want to read the entire chapter, but I just want to tell you, we know the passage, right, where, where we just read, where it said that he met the Lord, but what did he do first? Abraham, what did he do first? It said he bowed low. So number one, we don't initially come to the Lord asking for the big thing that we're wanting. Now, I'm not trying to say that won't work. I'm not saying that God won't answer you. We see that sometimes throughout the Gospels, right, where, where, where the blind, blind Bartimaeus is just crying out, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You, you see this throughout Scripture where someone comes with a major need, and this is all that's on their mind, all that's on their heart, and really all they can talk about, really. And God doesn't push that away. God's not 
angry at that, but I want to tell you there is a more effective way of getting God's attention. And not only that, but being yourself in a place where your faith can be built up so that you can believe for those things. And so like Abraham did, he first bowed low. That's what we've already done tonight. We've come, come, come in a posture of worship in a posture of praise, amen. So number one, before you ever make a request, you wanna worship, you wanna get into a place of praise. But even before you begin to worship, you wanna get into a place of thanksgiving, amen. So the first step of it all, and the reason for that, the first step of it all being thanksgiving, is because we want to get our mind off the things that are, that are holding us down, that are weighing us down, the shame. Much of the struggle that we will encounter in the place of prayer is our shame, is our previous acts of disobedience. The, the Lord doesn't want our conversation to be centered around sin, but the enemy wants your conversation in the place of prayer to be consumed with the topic of sin. He wants you to day and night, every time you walk in this building, every time you open your Bible, that all you can think about is what you previously did wrong, how you failed last week, you didn't get up and pray, you didn't fast when everybody was fasting and you, you just haven't been in the place of prayer like you should. And so that consumes, unfortunately, a huge majority or a good portion of our prayer life because the enemy wants to weigh us down with this. And so you have to acknowledge it. You have to get over it. And the way you do that is by talking to the Lord about it. And, and, and what you do is you bring the word of God into the, into the equation. Don't just listen to the enemy. Don't just say what's on your heart. What does the word of God say about your sin so first thing what yeah that's, that's one thing you need to ask and so I want to just declare some things over us it says that he separated our sin from us as far as the east is from the west friend you can come before the throne of grace boldly what to obtain mercy in your time of need you don't need to feel at any level of distance or separation so number one the mercy of God has separated your sins far from you you can come and make your request known but even knowing that you also need to declare that you're washed you're a child of God you're cleansed by the blood all these things that one of the things that I do one of my personal strategies in this area is what I'll do is I'll use what's on my mind, whatever's weighing me down, to immediately recycle that into conversation with the Lord, but with whatever his word says about it. So you might not be weighed down with your sin, you, or a sin, you might be weighed down with a struggle on the job, your, uh, a boss, bills, whatever the case may be. Use that as conversation material. Lord, you're my provider, and I'm not gonna worry about the bills. I thank you for providing. Get from there, now into the place of praise, where now it's no longer about the problems, now it's about what he's done, how good he is, how faithful he is. We were declaring a moment ago, he's fighting for us. All of a sudden, now your faith is rising because you're seeing his strength in the equation. You're seeing that he's bigger than the giant, amen? And now, the presence of God begins to enter the room. It says that he inhabits the praises of his people. And in that place, when you're in his presence, now you, like, Abraham, you naturally respond with worship. Our bodies will naturally bow down. Our hearts, our minds will naturally want to worship him. And now in this place, you, you might not even want to make a request known. You might, might forget about what you've, I've actually, I actually believe this. Most of our issues are solved at this place. Right here, when you hit the place of worship, most of the things that ail you would have already been solved. The Bible says that, again, I say our, our enemies, are, they melt like wax in his presence. One passage even says that mountains, they quake at his presence before the Lord when he enters. And so these things are going to move even in just when we've entered into the place of worship. And then now we've bowed low like Abraham. And it's interesting, there's one passage of scripture that says, uh, cast your burdens, cast your cares before the Lord. He cares for you. And I love what the Lord would say also. He said, come to me, all ye that are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And he says, take my yoke upon you. Take my burden, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's interesting, we lay our burden down to receive his. And this is what happened to Abraham. Abraham comes before the Lord. He doesn't know. He's not burdened. He's not concerned about what's going on in Sodom, but it's on the Lord's heart. And after Abraham worships and bows down, this is when the Lord begins to talk to him about what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
If you want to touch heaven and know what's on his heart, we have to come into a place of worship, lay down our burdens, and he'll give us his. Amen. I love what it says. Several times throughout scripture, it'll say that the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, or the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, or the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. But every now and then you'll see this, the burden of the Lord came. That the Lord wants to give you his burden for a nation. Amen. So before we ever intercede for a major area or something huge or for a mountain to be moved, feel the Lord's burden on it. Feel his heart. Weep for those people. Weep. I love in, in the book of Acts, we'll see this, that, that Paul would be ministering and all of a sudden he had a dream. A, a man appears to him crying out, help us. Help us. And he, then, he went to the, then he went to the west, west to preach to Macedonia. He was receiving the burden of the Lord for that people group. And then Paul all of a sudden had major breakthrough in that area. You'll see incredible results when you receive the burden of the Lord for whatever issue. So right now, you might not know what the Lord wants, wants to pray about, what, you, what the Lord is asking you to pray about. But I guarantee you, if you ask him, he'll put a nation on your heart. He'll put a people group. He'll put a major promise to believe, do you know that right now what we're facing, we don't have to be facing? That the, we don't just have to wake up and allow things to happen in the earth. We can push back against the darkness that I know we sing. It says the kingdom of God is pushing back the darkness. You can wake up in the morning and actually push back against what's happening. Isaiah 60 says that gross darkness will cover the people. Deep darkness the land. However, but the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. That in the midst of darkness, the glory of the Lord can rest upon us, amen? That we can, that we can affect change even in this. And this is what we see in this chapter, chapter, uh, chapter 18 of the book of Genesis, that we see Abraham now contend for Sodom and Gomorrah. I wanna tell you that there's some, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I, I've noticed that we're very quick to label a city that has any degree of sin or a great, a great deal of sin we're quickly to, to identify them as a Sodom you know, and Gomorrah type situation or some people write them off as God's going to release judgment. And we might not know, I, I'm not 100% sure uh, when God does that, how God does that, but I know this, if God would enlist Abraham to intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day, I believe he wants to, in, uh, to intercede for cities where there is incredible sin in our day. I mean, if you don't know about a city that, that, that what, to, what city to pray about, I would just choose the worst one that comes to your mind. If you wanna, I'm serious, the, what city do you know needs God the most? Intercede for that city, put it on your prayer list, and I'm telling you, this is very interesting. You, the, 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 we'll, we'll close in, in just a few minutes, but it's interesting that um, this strategy of, of, of coming to the Lord in this place of prayer, it has many personal benefits as well. We know that, what, what did Paul say? He said that if you come before the Lord with thanksgiving and prayer, the peace of God will guard your heart. So number one, if you do this, if you come before the Lord with thanksgiving, praise, worship, and then grab his burden and pray for it, you're going you're gonna to receive peace. What did Jesus say? He said, take my burden, my yoke, for it's easy. All the, all the heaviness that's been on you, it's actually going to be released, and you'll receive his yoke and his, his burden. But not only that, he says you'll find rest for your souls. You, the world wants to tell us and sell us all kinds of strategies on how to find rest, on how to be at peace. This is the pathway to peace. You know, it's interesting. The world doesn't glamorize prayer right now. The, the, right now, I, I know I've, I've presented this as the strategy for the day. Many would laugh at this, and some would even be offended at the idea that prayer can be a solution. Right now, when, when a major tra tragedy occurs, I've noticed that on social media, if you offer thoughts and prayers, that's an offensive statement right now. That's shocking to me that saying to someone, my thoughts and prayers are with you would be offensive, but it just goes to tell you the climate we're in, that right now people are surely trusting in everything else except prayer. But God has given us this weapon, this tool, and I, I, love, I love the scripture. I love how the kingdom of God works. The Bible says what's foolishness to man God will use, amen, that God uses the, the foolishness of preaching, the weak things of this world to confound the wise, and he would use something as simple as prayer. You know children can pray. 
Anyone can pray. You know, you don't even have to verbalize your prayer. It can be something that's just internal. And you might say, well, I mean, really, I don't have to verbalize it. You don't. That's even what Paul said. He says the spirit groans within us. When you take your deep breath right now, I want to tell you there's some intercession going on. You're doing something you might not even know. And so with that, it can be very challenging because there's not going to be a lot of praise and cheering and celebrating going on when you choose the place of prayer as the solution of what, of what needs to happen and, and, and bringing heaven to earth and, and seeing God break in and seeing the, the problems around us solve. Not a lot of praise from many of the people that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. I praise God that here at Inspire Church, we do have that. We do have leadership that that's what they do. They place priority and, and they place emphasis on this. But I want us to I have a video that I'd like to show us to just underscore this point, um, and, and if we could hit play on that in just a moment, but just to go to the idea of heaven is the one that we're chasing after when it comes, in, when it comes to the place of prayer. Heaven is our audience, that the Lord is our audience, not the world around us. <laughs> At Tiny Taylor University, a Christian school 70 miles northeast of Indianapolis, silence is more than golden. It's tradition. It's kind of weird. A little bit. In an age of ear-splitting arena speaker systems, of the constant assault on the auditory senses by scoreboard operators and pep bands, Taylor sets itself apart, at least one night a year, for a few minutes, with Silence. You're playing and you're, you're seeing the people, but you're just, you're not hearing anything. You hear people talking about it, how fun it is, but really, until you get to experience it for yourself, I really, really enjoyed it. Every year, the weekend before December finals, Taylor plays at home, and the crowd, comprising the entire student body and most of the faculty, almost everyone in costume, does not utter a peep emits not a sound until the Trojans score their 10th point. Then... <laughs> and still later... Is it something guys want to be, the one who scores the 10th? It gives you a little bit of an edge on campus. You know, everybody's congratulating you. Oh, we saw you score the 10th point kind of thing. Our assistant coach, Casey Coons, scored the 10th point all four years of his college career. And when ball hop, ball hop. Going into my senior year, they were all talking about how they were going to freeze me out. Uh, we got a steal, and the guy who threw me the pass was my roommate for four years. And as he was throwing it to me at half court, he yelled, shoot it. <laughs> They're going to let Cooch take it. Here we go. Here we go. Three on the way. Go! The silent night tradition came to life in the mid-1990s. That's when enough. Steve Brooks was a tail. It's interesting. In that video, I, I really like that video. Um, number one, I'm a big fan of basketball. And I love college basketball in particular. Really, really the, the crowd, the audience is incredible. If you've, I'm sure we've all been in those, those moments where we're shouting. I, that's one of my favorite things. And all throughout high school and, and, and college, that was one of my favorite things to do, is just go crazy in the stands. But it's interesting that in this video, you see a college that they celebrate not, nothing else but the 10th point. That is, it's, it's interesting because usually what you'll see is when the 10th point is scored at Duke University, U of H, TSU, there's not a lot of shouting for the 10th point. That it's simply the 10th point, usually scored in the first quarter or, or somewhere close to that. And we're really focused on the fourth quarter, right? Or maybe even at the end of the half, but right at the, right at the halftime mark, whenever a buzzer beater is going to be made, that's what we're really focused on. Maybe even some type of highlight dunk or some type of flashy shot, but not at Taylor University. They're, they go crazy over this 10th point. What doesn't matter elsewhere matters there. And so everybody on the team wants to score the 10th point. But when they go and play Duke or they go and play any other university at the 
opposing team's stadium and they score the 10th point. It doesn't really have that much flair to it. No one's really gunning or, or ball hogging for the 10th point, right? Because that's not what those audiences want to see. But at Taylor University on this particular day, they prioritize, they want to see the 10th point scored. And so everybody wants to score the 10th point. It has no real impact on the game of basketball. It, it doesn't move the needle whether you score 10 or not. It's, you want to win the game, right? But it's for some, some reason that audience wants to see it. And so the players want to do it, amen? They want to score that 10th point. And it's the same in our life, that really what we'll do is what our audience wants to see. On social media, people will post who what their followers want to see. We will drive what we think our neighbors call success. We will wear. We are moving at the pace of our audience. We are conducting ourselves based on those we believe eyes matter the most, that what our actions tell us is who really take inventory of how we have we been acting, what have we been doing, what do I spend my time doing, how do I talk, how do I dress, I guarantee you it's tied to who you believe your audience is, and it's interesting because in, I love this, that this, this picture of this audience going crazy over something that many other audiences would not really celebrate. And isn't that what, Paul, what the writer of Hebrews says, that he puts it in perspective in Hebrews chapter 11. He builds it up. He explains all the great hall of famers of faith. He says there's Abraham, and Abraham did this, and Enoch did this, and all of them did this by faith. He names so many. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, he says, and since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, therefore, let us lay aside every heavy weight and the sin which so easily besets us. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. However, he's, he's getting our eyes on the correct audience. Heaven wants to see a certain something, and if our eyes are not set on them, if we don't capture what they're prioritizing, what they're celebrating, and we only keep our eyes on those around us, I guarantee you we will not prioritize the things of heaven. If all we think about is what the people around us want to see, I guarantee you that's what we'll do. Right now, it's in, it, what I'm seeing and what, what, what I'm feeling in this moment, when I, when I hear that passage of scripture, when I read that, when I talk to you about it tonight, I just, it's, it's difficult, right? Because the cloud of witnesses isn't as visible as the ones we just saw in that screen. It's a walk of faith that I can't see Abraham and I'm not praying to Abraham. I'm not praying to Enoch. That's not the, that's not the issue. That's not even with the principle that Paul's wanting to, to put in perspective. But what he is saying is they're looking on. Amen. They're cheering us on when translation says, and, and in our life, if we ever get a glimpse of that, that those who went before us are cheering us on, that they're pushing for us, that they want to see us succeed, it will greatly encourage us. You reach a point in your walk with God when you need that, when you need those who've gone on before you to encourage you. Isn't that what we see even in the life of Jesus? He reached a point, I believe, where those around him so misunderstood him that he had to look to, to a different audience in, the, in a sense of who could encourage him and build him up, right? Whenever he's on the Mount of Transfiguration, no one even knows what's going on. Every time he talks about the cross, no one even understands it. Everyone says, no, that's not going to happen. And so at this point in time, he's on the Mount of Transfiguration, and who's talking with him? He's starting to have conversations with, with Elijah and Moses. This is the cloud of witnesses. And so what I want to encourage you to just know is this, that they are watching, they are cheering you on in the place of prayer. And not only that, like the writer of Hebrews says, keeping our eyes on the Lord. The heart of the Lord is pleased when we do this. Amen. The heart of the Lord is pleased when we choose prayer over all the other things, when we seek his guidance, when we seek his assistance in these major problems that we're facing. And so I want to pray over you tonight just before we close, but I do want to just remind us of a few of the things we've discussed tonight in the form of life application points. So number one, what have we talked about tonight? We've talked about having faith to believe God for big things, amen, to believe God to move a mountain in your life. How does that happen? 
How do you get into that position? How do you get to that posture of prayer? Get into a place of thanksgiving, praise, and worship. That we come before the Lord, magnifying Him, lifting Him up, amen, and receiving His burden. All that happens all at the same time. When you're magnifying the Lord, your burdens are being, are being bowed low. Your burdens are being dropped to the ground. Your worries are being cast down. However, then in that place, He's gonna give you His burden. And so, how often should you do it is the second thing I want to tell you tonight. Try to do this daily or as often as you can. That I know Paul said, pray without ceasing. That might seem difficult to do right now, but if you consistently pursue the Lord initially, carving out 10, 15, 30 minutes a day, I guarantee you'll, you'll see that it, all, it will grow, grow, grow more in your life. Now, it's interesting that whenever you seek to do this, you will naturally see obstacles. Even now, you're probably thinking of an obstacle that will keep you from doing this. You're probably already thinking of things that make it impossible for you in your life to, to have that type of prayer life, that you could never have that prayer life is what the enemy wants to tell you, that you can never have a consistent devotional life, or you might ha have had one, and you might say, no, that's not for me. I, I, I've, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. I've fallen too much. I don't know if I can do something like that. I don't know if I could step back into that prayer life or again, I don't know if I could ever develop something like that. Those are both lies from the enemy, friend. You can have a prayer life that moves heaven, that moves earth, that sees mountains shift. You don't have to have a, you don't have to have a degree. You don't have to be known by anybody. Heaven knows your name, friend. You could be like Mary, who no one knows, a teenage girl, and all of heaven comes into her room and says, we choose you tonight, Mary. You're the one where that's gonna birth something that shifts the world, changes time, amen, that that can be you in your bedroom tonight. That can be you next week, that you don't have to ever do any kind of quote unquote major ministry that God in heaven looks down and they are your audience, friend, that heaven enters your bedroom tonight. Heaven watches you. Heaven surrounds you that it's okay that even if you don't see it, walk by faith. If, if you do this, I guarantee you, you will see God enter in a mighty way. And I want to encourage you, you can have a prayer life of this magnitude. I, 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 I don't have time to go into it, but there was a, a, a sermon that Pastor Andrew preached just a few weeks ago, and man, it was powerful. It was on the topic of restoration, and we can stand to our feet at this time. And I just want to remind us that, that if you've strayed and you feel like, man, I can't, I can't have a prayer life like that, that sermon on restoration, I encourage you to listen to it. It was so profound, and it speaks to this point right now, but I want to reiterate something. And that is when Peter was being restored to the Lord and he was asking him, well, do you love me, Peter? Peter said, yes. He would say, feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? He said, yes, feed my lambs. He said, do you love me, Peter? Yes, feed my sheep. The Lord didn't stop there. The Lord went on to tell him that one day, Peter, you will go where you do not want to go. Another will gird you and take you where you do not want to go. John told us that that was concerning the death that Peter would die, that Peter had an inner resistance to what God was calling him to or what, what, would, what would have to occur in his life. He did not want to lay down his life for the gospel. Although he did in one sense, he did it in another, right? Because he would say, oh, I'll, go to the, I'll go to death with you, I'll go to jail with you. However, at the same time, his flesh was weak and he, he didn't want to do that, so he denied the Lord, right? And this is what the Lord is telling him. He says, Peter, one day you're gonna go where you don't wanna go, Peter. That the Lord is prophesying over Peter that he's gonna reach a point of love and devotion that he'd be willing to lay down his life for the Lord. And so friend, I wanna tell you, you might be looking at yourself and you might be like, yeah, but I'm not disciplined enough to prayer. I, I, I don't, I've not done that, I've, I've, I've not practiced that. I don't know if I could develop that. Friend, I wanna prophesy over you tonight and say one day you will go where your flesh doesn't wanna go. You're gonna get into places and hours of prayer intercession that your flesh didn't wanna get into in the past. You're gonna find yourself up at two and three in the morning Friend, contending for nations, contending for, for, for breakthrough for entire communities. Friend, you will find yourself caught up in the spirit at times when you never thought you would. Why? 
because God is going to develop it in your life. It's not going to be a work of the flesh. In fact, it's good that you stand before the Lord tonight with a posture of knowing that you could never do it on your own, that your flesh couldn't develop this prayer life, that in fact, you're not disciplined enough, friend. None of us are inherently disciplined enough. We all need the grace of God. And so that's number one. Number two, not only is God restoring you and is God gonna do it in you, but I wanna tell you, if you're not saved, if you're far from the Lord, I wanna pray over you tonight. And so if we would bow our head, if that's you, you've never given your heart to the Lord, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, tonight is your night. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Friend, I wanna give you that opportunity. I wanna pray over you tonight. Whether you're watching online, whether you're here in person, you might have a need. We're gonna pray for that as well. But if you've never given your heart to the Lord, I wanna pray over you. So even now, if that's you, you've never been saved, you've never accepted Jesus as your savior, pray this prayer with me. King Jesus, Lord, save me. Let's just declare that again, me and you, friend. King Jesus, Lord, save me, save my soul. Come on, friend, just declare that over yourself. Cry out for the Lord to save your soul tonight. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you to forgive me. Save me tonight in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Now, if you need a miracle, whether online or in person, we want to contend for that tonight. So just believe with me. You don't have to lift your hand, but we're, we're even for a few seconds in this room, let's practice tonight. Let's declare by faith that if someone needs a miracle, the Lord would answer, amen. So let's just do it just for 30 seconds. King Jesus, we thank you tonight. King Jesus, we present our needs to you tonight. We know that there's nothing too hard for you. We know that if there's someone watching tonight who is suffering in their body, that there's one who suffered for them and took stripes. And so we thank you that there were real stripes on your back that purchased real healing for our body today. So we speak healing in the name of Jesus. We speak life in the name of Jesus. Father, that if there's any bones that need to be restored, if there's any ligaments that need to be restored, Father, we speak life and restoration in the name of Jesus. Father, we speak the removal of any cancer. Father, the removal of diabetes, we just confess that those are not our portion, that the body and blood of our Lord Jesus are our portion. Father, if anyone in this room is sick tonight, we ask that you would heal their body in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Tonight, we thank you for joining us, whether you joined us online or in person. We don't want you to forget about service. This Sunday, we have a 9 and an 11 o'clock service. Bring your kids. We have a youth service that run parallel to the adult service. So please join us this Sunday morning. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. We pray that this service was a blessing to you. We're going to go out with worship, but you're dismissed.